welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast on real practical shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. We are here once again to talk about shamanism from the ground up and it feels brilliant to be back behind this microphone again uh, doing an episode. It's been far too long, so you'll be very pleased to know that me and Damon both have our spots in the diary sorted to get these episodes recorded regularly and get them coming out thick and fast. So watch this space, so to speak. Starting in the very next episode, uh, incidentally, we're recording that tomorrow, we're going to go on our deep dive into stage four of shamanic technique. So I thought in this episode, it'd be a really good opportunity to lay the foundation down for that, uh, pick Damon's brains a bit about what the stages are, do a bit of a recap on the stages, as well as why we have stages to begin with. Um, I thought that would be really interesting and would nicely lay the foundation down ready for uh, ready for stage four. Um, but that did bring up just one thing I want to discuss briefly, uh, and that is how we organise the episodes for you. Because if you've been with the podcast for a while, you might have noticed that we have two different types of episodes. We've got our general interest one-off types of episodes, which explore anything and everything shamanism related. You know, we've done all sorts of different topics on that, ranging from events, animism, uh, domestication of the dog, Santa Claus, Halloween, all sorts of things. And they kind of add to the variety and the the depth of the Woven Energy podcast, uh, I think. And I really enjoy those episodes, so I want to keep those going. But also we have these deeper dive episodes where they last for multiple episodes and they go really in depth into certain topics. Our next one, of course, being stage four. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is label the episode so that you'll see if it's part of a series and you'll see which number it is related to that series. So super organized moving forwards. Now, um, with that said, Damon, how are you doing, man? It's uh, It's been a while. Uh, it has indeed, mate. I'm doing good. Uh, a bit overloaded with stuff, as I'm sure you are as well. But uh, yeah, but yeah, to get two episodes in two days is going to be a lot different from what we'll be doing a late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's in the diary. Yeah. We've got. I, I call them yeah. non-negotiables, Damon. I call them non-negotiables, and I've got two of them now. Yeah, that's um, great. Mate. One is this podcast on a Thursday, and this is and and also a, a workout with our good friend Paul on a Thursday as well. So I can. Yeah. Uh, I can easily awesome. keep this up, so we'll uh, awesome. we'll see how it goes. Also, um, on the uh, on the subject of the uh, the the one off or unusual episodes that we do, um, as we were yeah. talking about just before, the, the spooky side of Halloween went down quite well based on the statistics. So yeah. maybe we should maybe we should be doing a bit more spooky stuff going forwards. I don't know. <laughs> but it, I, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm taking credit for the word spooky in that title. Uh, I think you, that's what did it. Take all the credit my, for that, mate. It was your my, idea. My clickbait, my clickbait hat went on. <laughs> it was entirely <laughs> joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good episode. It was a good episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I rang you up at the weekend, right? And we we had a mm. a chat about stage four, and um, mm. I mentioned that it would probably be a good idea to talk about the stages in general, um, and and why we even have stages to kind of give context to stage four. Uh, yeah. And we kind of quickly realised that no one knows that would become a whole episode itself. Um, so whether this becomes a whole episode or a shorter episode, I don't know yet. But I thought it'd be quite interesting to talk about that. And I've definitely got a few questions on Chelicity. Um, we sure. can't talk about Chelicity enough. So what do you think, Damon? Do you think that's a good uh, a good yeah, place to start? I mean, before... the whole the whole thing with the levels of shamanism, I, mm. I always worry about things heading in an exoteric direction. I mean, we've also done a lot of talking on the podcast in the past about the difference between exotericism, that's religion or spirituality based on belief and faith, versus esotericism, which is spirituality based on, or religion, based on technique. Mm. And, you know, in the latter case, the idea is to learn largely from nature, you, as a shaman or an esotericist, which is basically a shaman operating in a civilized, settled society, you put yourself in positions where nature is able to teach you as directly as possible without human beings intervening in that process. You're trying to, I think as I've described before, you're trying to headbutt let nature or take nature full in the face. Mm. In terms of exotericism, it's very much the opposite of that. It's where well, you're trying to learn from God, right? But how is God represented? God is represented through churches. It's represented through holy books, through scriptures, through dogma, through beliefs, through rules, uh, through regulatory systems, even through legal systems. 
you are trying to learn from God, but of course between you and God in all of those exoteric religions are layers and layers of human beings. Yeah. There are, uh, you know, great examples of that uh, is, is the or greatest example of that probably is the Roman Catholic Church, which intervenes yeah. between human beings and God on a global scale, a literally global scale with billions of people. Um, it's also that a way the, of them keeping power, isn't it, as well, and maintaining well, power for sure, and control I'm, I'm, of the masses. But I'm not talking about, that is true, but I'm not talking about the motivations behind doing it. I'm just talking about what it actually is. That's what it is. Yeah. In many ways, it's like salvation by proxy. You have faith in a proxy, and that proxy will see to your salvation or your liberation or whatever you want to call it. Mm. You are not doing what a shaman or an esotericist is constantly trying to do, which is far from having or, or giving reverence to that intervening stuff, they are trying their best to ditch it, to get it away from them, to, to move it out of the equation. And this is all based on the premise of animism. Animism, as we've said, shamanism is a set of spiritual techniques employed by spiritual specialists in animistic societies, in animism, you are simply a part of nature. And the base premise, if you if you want to think about it in theological terms, the base premise is that God is found through nature. Um, yeah. you, you learn about the universe, the underlying principle of nature is God. Now, if that's not true, then animism and shamanism are wrong. But endless experience and a good deal of evidence tends to suggest that it is true one of the things that i've always taken and we've talked about this before as a great piece of evidence for the veracity of shamanism is that disconnected small tiny disconnected communities all over the world have become fully independently of each other shamanistic Mm. Now, I I would make the contrast that no community anywhere in the world has become Christian without the Bible or parts of it being involved, or at least the church, or some kind of creed, like the Nicene Creed. No um, community anywhere in the world has become Islamic without the Quran or without experts in the Quran. Um, and no community anywhere in the world has become Buddhist without access to some of the Buddhist sutras or people who are teaching what's contained within them. No community anywhere in isolation has ever independently redeveloped a pre-existing exoteric religion. And there's a good reason for that. The reason for that is it doesn't come from nature. It comes from people. Or, if yeah. you really believe it, it comes from God via very, very special people. For instance, Christ. Mm. Mm. So, the point that I'm worried about whenever I talk about the seven levels of shamanism is, am I just, or are we just creating through woven energy yet another exoteric religion in which people believe in the seven levels of shamanism? Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is why yeah, I wanted yeah. to, to bring it up, because yeah. there's no doubt that categorizing it into levels for the purpose of trying to explain it and teach it on this podcast is, is a good thing. Um, but what mm. I find interesting as well is um, you see those, the, the number seven everywhere. It's, it's like you, you yeah. see it in, in all sorts of different religions, these sorts, this sort of seven different levels of hell, seven different levels of heaven, the seven astral That's planes, right. the seven this, the seven that. And um, mm. I was, I was just, but I we, guess I was just interested. Of, yeah, we did a bunch of episodes on Mithraism, didn't we? There's the seven stages of Mithraism as well. The and, and that is true, and that is some evidence that seven might be an okay number. But what I'm trying to, what I'd like to suggest is that the number is not important. Yeah, it's it's about how to. We when we started this podcast, we talked about we're going to do a podcast to tell that that tries to help people to become shamans. Yeah, themselves, not that encourages people to go and get 
treatments, spiritual treatments from a shaman. Or to seek a shaman's guidance or any of that kind of stuff. Or to make them feel good about themselves or to make them, you know, have better lives or whatever it is. The, the point was we wanted to teach people how to become shamans or, or not necessarily teach, but offer some guidance as to how somebody might go about that. And that's what our podcast has been about. And I think that's why we've had such a great response to our podcast. Uh, mm. Quick shout out to the patrons. Thanks, guys. You know who you are. You're awesome. Yeah, and definitely. And um, so what I think is that if it's five levels or six levels or seven levels, it doesn't matter because it's actually one thing. It's one progress. There's the starting point, and then there's like a, a number of life journeys, different stages of which, a number of possible life journeys towards becoming a shaman, different stages of which have commonality with each other between life journeys and within an individual's life journey, different stages of which tend to happen in a certain order. And so if we're talking about, quote-unquote, the seven stages of shamanism, really what we're describing is the life path or life journey of a person progressing towards becoming a shaman. And it just so happens that breaking that down into seven stages is quite convenient, but it's perfectly possible to break it down into six stages or five stages or four stages or three stages or, or two stages <laughs> or one stage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the bottom line is the same kind of stuff has to happen. It doesn't have the nature of shamanism. It doesn't have to happen in exactly the same kind of way. But the end goal, if you like, the direction in which it's heading is held in common between all of those inf or virtually infinite different life pathways that can lead towards being a shaman. And I'm trying not to use the term shamanism because that's a very academic term because, you know, there isn't really such a thing as shamanism. That either, either somebody is a shaman or they're not. And then if they are a shaman, it's like to what extent? The And that's really what we're talking about when talking about the seven stages. It's not really the seven stages of shamanism, that it's the seven stages or six or five or four or three or two or one or nine or 27 <laughs> of becoming a shaman. Yeah. But seven seems to be convenient and different cultures, as you rightly pointed out, different cultures seem to have come down on the number seven in seemingly independently of each other um, as, as a convenient way to break that down. But really, it's continuum. Yeah. And, and or absolutely, 100%, it's not you complete stage one and then you go on to stage two. <laughs> yes. You complete stage two and go on to stage three. <laughs> These things all overlap. Each stage, with a, if you want to number them like that, each stage with a lower number is the bedrock and is entirely extends throughout the stage with the next higher number, which is then the bedrock and extends throughout the stage with the next higher number. And so yeah. one of the ways you can think is ways of taking on uh, a shamanic lifestyle or ways of losing seven things that prevent you from being a shaman. There's another way to look at it. Seven mm. different aspects of the miasma, and lots of cultures have looked at it in this way as well, uh, you know, including the ancient Greeks. Mm. The, well, they have words for it in Mongol, don't they? They, have, they? they actually have specific words for different types of the miasma, because we talked oh, about that. See how shamanistic their culture is. They have multiple words for some of those levels. Mm. <laughs> so, it's quite interesting. And that's why, you know, that's why we chose Mongol early on. It's a pretty good language mm. for talking about shamanism, because Mongolia was a sh thoroughly shamanistic society, even today, despite their flirtation with communism. Um, they have remained a very, very shamanistic yeah, yeah. Uh, culture. Well, what what you just said, um, I think, is is something super important, and and definitely the older I get, and and the more I tend to think about things, is is when you said the seven stages is it's absolutely a continuum. It's not like it's seven blocks that you progress through, which is the easy way to think about it. It's a it's a it's a a, a continuum. It's like it's like the rainbow, isn't it? It's like you've got yeah. the rainbow isn't just seven colors. It's a complete continuum. They run into of each other. And the more that you dive into anything these days that I find, the more that I dig into things, the more 
that they reveal to you as being a continuum and being uh, not black and white. It's, it's very things aren't things aren't as black and white as you as you as you think they are when you're a bit younger and you're a kid, you know. Yeah, and you can you can use the analogy of belts in the martial arts, at least when they're done well. Belts are done so badly in the martial arts. I probably shouldn't have mentioned it as an example, but some of the most talented martial artists, you know, I do martial arts that, that don't have belts and I do martial arts that do have belts. But some yeah. of the most talented martial artists I've worked with in my life who are in those martial arts that do have belts, they spend an awful lot of their time. That the very high, Some of the very high-ranking martial artists who got super high, you know, Dan grades or, or belt colors or whatever, they they spend an awful lot of their time doing the same stuff as the white belts uh, because that's where the important stuff is, you know, the absolute foundations because all of that stuff remains there in those upper grades, if you like. And well, so, I like to think of it. It's like you uh, on the guitar or the piano. On the, let's, say, let's take the guitar. You play a scale on the guitar and you're a beginner. It's going to sound different than a master playing that same scale yeah. at the same speed, the same style on that guitar. It's it's just going to sound better. It's going to sound like it's got more essence yes. to it, more more that certain something to a beginner. Yeah. You know, a beginner it sounds quite spiky and quite staccatoy, yeah. but a, a master playing the exact same thing, you know, it's, it's a different thing. Same on the piano. Yeah. And I guess it's the exactly. same with a lot of things. Same with dance and the yeah. same with yeah. all sorts of different things. And I guess the same well, with shamanism. I'm, I'm sure that some of the best, I don't know much about playing the piano. I know you're far more than me, but I'm sure that some of the best pianists in the world have not outright ejected or rejected C major. <laughs> you know, no, no. Scale. It's just that your, your, your expertise and your, uh, your years of experience this essence flows into yeah. the way that you play. And you can't yeah. help it because the more experience yeah. you develop, the more of that will channel through your playing. Um, and so an ex an expert at the piano, a, 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 a very, very, a very capable pianist will play exactly the same piece as a beginner and it will sound totally different. It'll just sound so much more listenable to, it'll sound more graceful, it'll have that essence to it, that magic mm -hmm. that, that a beginner can't, can't give mm, mm. um so so yeah, uh... so yeah so in terms of doing a kickoff then one thing that might be good is to uh, if we go through seven stages if you like if we talk through seven stages and at each mm. stage maybe present it in two alternative different ways one way is what you are learning as a sham, or what abilities you are developing to support your movement towards becoming a shaman at each yeah. of the seven stages, but also what you are trying to lose at each of those stages, which part of the miasma, which part of the, the impact of all of that stuff that so heavily affects us throughout our development. You know, you want to think of some examples of the, the, the stuff that I'm talking about religion, education, politics, uh, science, uh, the media, um, parenting, uh, just generally interactions with people, who we sports, think we are, having friends, all of these things, um, yeah, who, who we think we are, what we think is important, the zeitgeist of our times, all of those kind of things would be examples of the stuff that I call the miasma. Uh, and some of the stuff is good and some of the stuff is bad, but that's not the point. I mean, science is a classic example of that. Some science is absolutely fantastic. You know, close loved ones of mine wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for science, uh, which is amazing. On the other hand, there are lots of people dead uh, because nasty people use scientifically developed weapons to kill them. Um, innocent people, I mean. So it's not what the thing is, but the point is that whether it's good or whether it's bad, that's irrelevant to the fact that this stuff all gets in the way of becoming a shaman. And mm -hmm. so when you're practicing, however much you love civilization, however much you love religion or spirituality or whatever it is, whatever aspect the, the miasma you're into, sports, uh, you know, 
different aspects of education, different subjects, theology, particular interest of mine. But I'm, while it, it's something that I'm very, very interested in, it's also something that I'm thoroughly aware is a barrier towards becoming a shaman. All of that stuff, how much you love it, you have to set it to one side in terms of shamanic practice. And the first thing you've got to set to one side uh, in the path towards, or the way of a shaman, or the path towards becoming a shaman, is thinking, rational thought, baseline activity. Why do you have to do that? Because our cultures obsess, and it's not just in the West, so you can't just blame the West for this, our cultures obsess over baseline activity, mm. obsess over all problems can be solved by baseline ratiocination. That's a premise that's built into our uh, cultural frameworks, both in the West, with our tradition that comes down from people like Plato and indeed Jesus, um, and in the East, um, where the tradition comes down from, well, Confucius, largely, um, but there are others, the Buddha, to a certain extent. And the, or incidentally, a plug for the upcoming um, uh, Heretics episode on yoga. That should be interesting. The Buddha gets a mention in that one. <laughs> so... We, we need to learn the skill of setting aside thinking. That's what we culturalists, the Bhaktam Shesa is one of the Mongol terms for it. It's like emptying your cup. It's the grail. Sir Galahad yeah. became, became the grail. He achieved the grail. He didn't find the grail. You empty your cup so that nature can fill it. Uh, to use mm. a Chinese term, famous Chinese term, is you can't put tea in a full cup. You can't become a shaman with a full cup. Unfortunately, you can't become a shaman with a 50% full cup, let alone an entirely full cup. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's learning the skill of emptying yourself. And we've, you know, we've talked... Go for a minute. Uh, I, was, um, I have a... A few, a few, uh, I wanted to ask you about Chilicity a little bit today, which I'm hoping would help the various listeners um, a different, a kind of a, a different angle in, and um, you know it brings me nicely onto that. But it's like um, I, I kind of shamefully admitted to you the other day that I've got into cricket a little bit, and um, mm. for some reason uh, throwing a a rock at a, at a target for five days straight is uh, appealing to me, and I have no idea why. Um, but one thing that they talk about is being in form, being out of form, being in Nick, being out of Nick. And mm. it got me thinking about, you know, we talk about flow a lot and relating flow to chelicity, which is fair enough. We've talked about that a few times. But is there another layer to it? Because it's like, okay, you take you take a, a batter or you take a guitarist, a master of his craft, anybody who's a master of his craft, and they can either... Um, be in form where things just work and 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 you know like things just happen. It's easy and it's and it's all flowing, or it or it doesn't, and you're locked in your head. You're locked in cyclic thoughts, mm -hmm. and it's not happening. However, that's irrespective of the fact that the batter, the musician, the person is a master of their craft. It's not like they're learning the craft. So I guess my question is, it's like. Um, what is it about chelicity against the components of chelicity that we talk about? Baseline, midline, topline, uh, mm. paragalti, neoteny, and grace, and, and the interaction of those that means that somebody can be very skillful and a master at their craft, but yet either be in chelicity or not in chelicity, if that makes any sense. Yeah, because of the examples that you've given are all examples of guchach, and guchach is only a part of chelicity. It's not all of it. Yeah. So yeah. So the issue is, yes, the you see an awful lot of parts of chelicity in top flight sportsmen. You see an awful lot of parts of chelicity in uh, really good martial artists. You see a lot of parts of chelicity in, actually, you can see it in some politicians who can, uh, who they often describe them as charismatic. That's the ones where they talk nonsense, but people still believe them anyway. You know, yeah. uh, you can you can see people who go it can, are able to go into that state of flow because they are so used to their uh, the activity. But that's the point. That's on a narrow sense. It's within a very narrow band of activity. You put them into a different context. 
you know, so say it's a, a, a top flight pianist, you put him into a different context. Yeah. Mm. Get him doing volleyball or something. You won't see, you may see some benefits of the fact that he's a top flight pianist, but if he's never played volleyball before, you won't see the same kind of no. a, a guh in the activity. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is the, the lack of familiarity, but the other one is what is the purpose? What's the purpose of those things? The purpose of becoming a top flight pianist, one of them, is to express yourself, which is quite a shamanistic, uh, quite a shamanistic goal. Or it's heading towards shamanism, more animistic. And other ones to entertain people. Entertaining people is absolutely 100% not the purpose of shamanism. And you get that yeah. with sports as well, the same kind of thing. The other components of chelisti are every bit as important as guchach. We we talk about guchach a lot because it's actually quite difficult to achieve. And it is technique dependent. You can only achieve guchach in a range of technique. And that's why I'm always trying to broaden my portfolio of shamanistic technique. Because the broader the range, the, you're, you're headbutting different parts of nature. Yeah, but bat and toshal teen are really, really important. So you do see toshal teen in uh, yourself included in a lot of musicians. It's that ability to improvise. The you know a lot of jazz musicians do that deliberately, um, and it can be very entertaining. Uh, you also get um, Billy Joel can automatically. Apparently, he can automatically, I've seen him do it on stage, automatically generate Mozart. Uh, when he was a kid learning, he didn't enjoy his piano lessons and he didn't enjoy playing Mozart. Uh, but he learned how to automatically generate Mozart. So when his parents came around, he could pretend that he was practicing. Uh, that is just improvise in the style of Mozart. Uh, yeah. And he does it live on stage. If you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube somewhere. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing a master can do. But there's also bat. Bat is the actual crux of it all, really. Bat is the underlying strength that a shaman needs to deal with the unusual things that go on in a shaman's world, in a shaman's universe. And bat is intimately related with both Guchach and Toshaltin. So to give you, for example, if you are a real piano shaman, um, you know, if you're going to use piano as your shamanistic technique, almost certainly you you want to start Toshal Teen with the instrument itself. You don't want somebody else building that instrument for you. If I was going to be a piano shaman, the first thing I would do is learn how to build a piano. That would be my first step, day one. Yeah. Um, and then I would start experimenting with natural, the, try to use the most natural materials that I possibly can. I would take the piano that I'd built, or pianos, because it would probably be a series of different pianos. I would take them out into nature, and I would start experimenting with playing the kind of stuff you do, my own generative music, um, improvisation, getting those vibrations of the piano out into the natural environment and allowing them to permeate myself in a state of chelicity as a human being, this this would be the start of level one. I'd be playing without thought. And yeah. level two would be I'd be starting to sense what the vibrations of the piano were doing inside my body as a kind of like ultrasound, if you like. And then as you go through level three and four, I'd be creating a weave with that piano, an automatically generated weave with that piano, that is has standing aspects to it and it's interacting with the energy within the environment. And also I'm trying to pick up on the interference between the energy of the environment and the energy patterns that I'm creating with my naturalistic instrument. Mm. There's a start, there's the first four levels of shamanism using piano mm. as a as a means to go forwards. What I would absolutely never do is learn a set piece yeah. because as soon as I learn a set piece for Elise or sort of for Elise I think or Lisa I don't know what the German pronunciation is um, Beethoven wrote I, I would not learn that 
if I wanted to become a shaman. I would get myself on Creative Piano Academy to give myself some stuff to play. Uh, but I'd be much more interested in the resonance of the instrument, the strings, the hammers we're making, and how that's permeating me and permeating the environment, and what the environment does in response to that. That would be my main area of interest in terms of my chelicity. Um, you know what I mean by just that lightweight observation yeah. itself that shamans do. That would be my main interest. The exact music that I was playing, as long as it was very varied and there was a lot of richness in it and it was constantly changing, then I wouldn't really care what it was and I wouldn't care if it sounded good either. Mm. Uh, so there's a, the start of a shamanic path. I don't know if anybody, I wonder if any, I'm just starting to wonder if anybody's ever done that. <laughs> that would oh, be I so might cool. do. <laughs> that <laughs> I might, might be I might so that, cool. Without, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go full circle and do a daemon and do that, but not tell anybody I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. um, let me yeah. give you three examples of chillicity then, which uh, I would love your commentary on. And I think this will really help people. So yeah. number one, guitarist on stage, master of his craft, and is in the middle of a guitar solo. And it's just, just working. It's like he's not even thinking about the solo. It's just in the moment, and he's almost a conduit to that, right? Um, yeah. Against uh, thinking about it in, 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 the, in the solo, and it's not quite as good. It's not quite that kind of, got that kind of quality to it. So, that, so there's that. Then there's another example which I thought about was about myself and um, maybe other people relate to this, but I am I the older I get, the more I realise, and I know we talk about not putting ourselves in boxes and stuff, but I am a raging introvert. And I think um, the, the thing that I experience is like when I'm in groups of people and talking around groups of people, sometimes, sometimes I'm in a state of flow and it's great, you know, it's effortless. Other times, I just retreat into myself. I let everybody else do the talking. I feel a head. little bit awkward. I'm in my <laughs> head. But yeah. the difference is I'm not a master orator. I am, I'm not a master of the craft of speaking by any stretch. But yet I still experience that flow yeah. and, I, and I still experience that in my head. Um, so I, I'd love your, your, yeah, your yeah. comment so, on, so on that. So there's the, a whole host of things I could uh, comment on that. My first comment is forget that term master. Yeah, I, I use the term mastery in the sense that that you know you you are good enough at something that you can do it without thinking about it. Yeah. So people are variably masters in lots of different aspects of their life. Most of us are masters of switching on a light switch. We don't do a <laughs> lot of thinking when we switch on when we flick on a light switch. Actually, flicking <laughs> on a light switch is is one of the most shamanistic things that most people do. Um, we're also masters of heavy swing doors we tend to go through those things without too much of a problem uh but you try to train a robot to push one of those doors open you know the ones i mean they're like the ones i have in those like, like institutions and they're like got a heavy spring on them they swing closed quite heavily yeah, yeah. Uh, you try and train a robot to open one of those doors it's a non-trivial task a really it's a non-trivial, non-trivial task, task but i'll tell you what they're bloody getting yeah. there and it's scary yeah yeah <laughs> that's this is true this is true but the, the point is that they're, they're trivial examples of mastery the yeah. term mastery is not helpful because i i in, in some ways it's helpful just to give the idea of for instance if you're talking about spirit dance you master a particular spirit dance movement to the point where you can do it without thinking about it a particular set of different related movements yeah so you're a master mm. of those movements yeah but there's a whole host of other movements that you're not a master of so saying that somebody is a master intrinsically in the person themselves is is never true. Nobody's ever a it's master. It's so interesting. It's it's like it's so obvious now you mention it. I'm just mm. putting it in a box. I'm going he, that is a mas- I'm putting mastery in a box and going you're not a master until you get to this sort of arbitrary state. But yeah, yeah. That, it makes complete sense. Yeah, of course. Like I said before and like you said everything's a continuum. Ex- exactly. And you know, you can also see it in art, right? You know, yeah. some, some somebody... I mean, I went to a Banksy exhibition recently when I was over in Austria. That guy is a phenomenal artist. I'm not, Despite how famous he is, I think he's underrated. It's absolutely phenomenal, especially when you see the cl- stuff up close, you know. Um, and I'm a big fan of Banksy. But... And a lot of people, you're not supposed to know, but nobody's supposed to know who he is, does it? That's part of the mystery around him. 
but his stuff is yeah. just brilliant. And and one of my favourite quotes in the universe comes from Banksy, which is, "You may win the rat race, but you're still a rat." <laughs> which is just <laughs> that's brilliant. There's a guy that sort of understands the miasma, right? Yeah. The um, uh, that's such a good quote. I might get. I want to get a t-shirt with that on it. The issue is that. Probably Banksy himself will be happy to admit that he couldn't paint Rembrandt's Nightwatch to the standard that Rembrandt painted Rembrandt's Nightwatch. But my other point is that I don't think Rembrandt could have painted some of the stuff that Banksy's painted to the standard that Banksy's painted it. They both have their own way. They both have their own style. And within that style, they're both masters. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah. And so the term master is unhelpful, I think. I mean, I do use it. I'm guilty. But I don't use it so much in the martial arts anymore. The, 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 the reason I don't use it in the martial arts, uh, except out of respect for some of my teachers, is that to me, master is something that other people should start to call you with who are experts in your subject domain. Yeah. So if you're mm. a martial artist and other martial artists who are experts start calling you a master, then you probably are. One of the cringiest things I ever... I, I saw this years ago. Some Some guy... I can't remember what the martial art was. I think it was a Korean martial art or something. He had a badge stone on his sewn onto his um, jacket with the word master written on it in English, not even in, I think it was Korean, not even in Korean, it was written in English, master. I'm like, if you need a badge, you're not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's as simple as that, you know? And I don't like that we're not worthy thing because if you worry about not being worthy, we have this, this is one of the things that's happened to the Shinshu Kyo. A lot of the Shinkyu Kyo were, in, in this, for people who don't know, these are new wave of Japanese spirituality that started arriving, uh, arising in the 19th century. There were a whole host of different, a lot of Toshal team going on in terms of spirituality, a whole host of different spiritual traditions, vast majority of which were, such, were founded by a new wave of Japanese shamans or a new wave of shamans. But what happened to almost all those traditions without exception is that the shamanic technique that the founder of that tradition was teaching to their followers disciples whatever you want to call them the next generation of shamans that shamanic technique was learned successfully usually by the next generation but the third generation started frowning on it they started Mm -hmm. and uh, to a large extent banning people from practicing the techniques As the religion became exotericized, banning people from practicing the techniques that the founder of their own religion had encouraged them to practice the shamanistic techniques. So that's how quickly, just within three generations, things can become exoteric. What's one of the ways that they stop people from doing that? Say, oh, those guys back then, the second generation, they were masters, they were... Wonderful. They were very special people who'd been singled out by the the founder of our tradition. We're not worthy. We're not able to do those kind of techniques. That will kill your Toshal team, adopting that kind of attitude. We're not worthy um, because they're masters and we're not. So we won't try it. And the masters will will tell us what to do. We we must follow their instruction manual. You will never become a shaman with that attitude. I promise you, hand on heart, you will never... Unless you can get rid of that attitude is one of the things you need to get rid of straight away. This is level one. This is chalisti. We're not worthy. You are worthy. Shamanism is a natural part of human beings, not even just human beings. Shamanism is a natural part of, I would say, the lives of pretty much all primates, the lives of most social animals. Uh, wolves, for instance, the it's an intrinsic part of nature. You have every right. You don't need anybody's permission. So mm. that's that's in terms of the mastery. Now, when you give me the the example of the guitarist Eddie Van Halen or somebody, you know, standing on the stage doing deep in the guitar solo, um, what 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 sprung to mind in terms of the parts of Celestia's show? There's a or slash out of um, Guns and Roses or something like that. Yes, Hen- Jimi Hendrix, yeah. uh, John Mayer, somebody who's yeah, just this, completely in the in these the guys. Zone. Yes, okay. Wrapped so this is what I'm talking about. In the moment. parts of Celestia. So let's let's pick probably you know the, the one most people think is is the best. I don't know if it's true or not, but Jimi Hendrix. I do have a Jimi Hendrix LP, so I must like him. The Jimmy oh, Hendrix I, is on I, stage. I, he's on stage. He's in a state of jealousy. He's doing guh 
Oh, sorry, he's doing... He, 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 I'll Goku's just say one thing about Jimi yeah. Hendrix. His Toshal teen was through the roof. Nobody yeah, was doing yeah, what yeah, he was absolutely, doing at the time. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is what oh, I was about to say. Those guys His Toshal teen was amazing. His Toshal teen was amazing. He's in his... his um, Bat is uh, probably okay, the, but but we'll come back to Bat. And then also amazing is his Guru. Yeah. Th- mm. Those... But it's not balanced. And the, the reason I said his bat is okay is I suspect that if somebody had snuck up behind him while he was doing that seminar, or that sorry, while he was doing that solo and pushed him hard with both hands in the back, he'd have probably fallen over. Yeah. Because the bat isn't there. Yeah. If, if somebody could tried you, to could do you, that... Could you just explain, explain that? Well, they wouldn't have been able more. to because he would have felt the approach. I've got you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The Burkshit Harte is a really important part of bat. Yeah, we've talked about that. It's like the yeah. an, an eagle's focus is very, very sharp, but it's not focused in on a pinpoint. It's not focused in on the springs or the guitar or the fretboard. It's expansive. It's a kind of expansive focus, which is a weird concept to a lot of people. Because when people say, I want to focus, they mean, you know, I'll put headphones. If, if somebody's a programmer, I want to focus. I put my headphones on. I shut the door. I make myself a cup of tea. I get my head down on the keyboard and I start co- coding and I focus. That's not Burej Shikhat Harate. That's not the kind of focus that Bat has. Bat has the kind of focus that an eagle has when it's high up in the sky, above the ground, and it's sharply intent on everything that's going on in its world. Mm. It sees a Mm. tiny movement from a tiny animal moving somewhere in probably a square kilometre or more of area from all that way up in the sky. Because... Although it's focused, although it's intent, it's not focused in. It's focused out. Do you follow what I mean? And so this it, is it, what I mean is great sportsmen, great guitar players, great all sorts of, they are good, all good in one of th- probably three major, or one or two or three major aspects of cellisti. But they're rarely, sometimes they are, but they're rarely strong on all three. And if you want Bagtamsia Sao, if you want Chalisti, you uh, t- t- as a base for moving on to the next level, remember, they're not trying to move on to the next level. They have no interest in that. They're, they're entertainers, they're sportsmen, they're whatever. They're, they're, it, it suits their purposes, and that's absolutely fine. I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying if your end goal purpose is to become a shaman, that's not good enough. Mm. It doesn't matter how wonderful you are, uh, two of them, if the third one is weak, it's not a good basis for Amska. It's not a good basis for level two. Yeah. So here's one more, here's one last example then off the back of that. And um, that's just um, obser- for, through observing my daughter. And she's like, she's just about nearly three years old now. And I'll observe her and she'll be going, she'll get into these states where you clearly watch her and she does not give a crap about who's watching her. She's just like, la, 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 dancing it's around. It's so easy she's, when you're young. She's, you haven't she, indoctrinated she, her enough yet, mate. No, no. And she's just completely <laughs> in the zone. And and also she'll just start playing with things. Um, like I'll put this over here and I'll take this and I'll turn it upside down and that's interesting and I'll put this. And so it's like yeah. got, she, she's got this whole thing going on and not that, seeking that, permission she's not asking yeah. you if she's okay yeah but yeah. she's not quote unquote a, a master at something so <laughs> well it's, like, it's all the, relative the, mate it's, it's, it's all, all relative. relative yeah yeah um so it's interesting these different aspects of flow or these different aspects of but i, I would that dispute getting... that she's not a master of something she's not a master of or she is a master of not having <laughs> as many miasmatic effects as adults <laughs> yeah. have. Yeah, she's a master of getting rid. Oh, she never had it in the first place, did she? So, no, I mean, we can learn in the first so place. much. We can learn <laughs> so much looking at kids, man, and, and seeing how they behave and what they do and how they how they interact with the world around them. And exactly. um, it's interesting because with kids, uh, and I think I've mentioned this before, but like, I got this sort of um, what, what I noticed about her was that. We got these little magnetic blocks, and she. The, the point is, the the purpose of the blocks, quote unquote, is to build stuff. You know, you you have to you have to build little shapes and and, and all that, and that's the that's what the instruction manual says. But Gia was like, no, I'm not doing that. So she just sort of just 
took one block, put it over here, took the other one, put it over here, and created little 2D shapes on the floor and just continuously morphed this thing into different types of yeah, shapes. Yeah. It's clearly not what you're supposed to do with them, but she found a way of well, who says what entertaining you're supposed to do herself. Exactly, exactly. That, that's kind of my point. That's the whole, like, with kids, would you say, like, they're just exploding with that midlife. Yes, that, that and then and team. then we, the older generation, yeah, we come and train it out, it out of them. Out of we? them. <laughs> we train it out of them rather than encouraging it. We train it out of them. It's yeah, it's yeah. horrific. It's a crime, really. Uh, but if you look at the people who've really moved, or some examples of people who've really moved the world on, uh, Einstein would be a great example of that. They are people who have a serious problem with authority. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's uh it's it's that kind of thing. You know, they they are not people who are reverent. And it seems to me that that is quite important in or has been quite important in some of mankind's or human beings' great achievements in life. Uh Donald Henderson is another guy who springs to mind. He's the guy who led the uh, global eradication of smallpox. You know, mm. Can you imagine if he'd, he'd been dead respectful and submissive to all of those world leaders, you know, who needed to be involved in this global campaign to get rid of smallpox? You know, so, oh, yes, yes, you know, it, he would have got nowhere. He would have absolutely got nowhere. And his team would have got, I know it wasn't just him, but his team would have got nowhere. Um, and that yeah. is one of the greatest achievements. I mean, it's not widely known compared to the moon landings and stuff, but the, the global eradication of smallpox is yeah, one of the greatest the, achievements of human of, beings, uh, you know. It reminds me of the other guy who was um, involved in discovering why people were dying on the op in the operating theatre back in the old days. It's a, a loose story in my head, but, but basically the guy was the guy was thinking, look, there's, there's little little bacteria things that are causing this, uh, we should wash our hands before we actually treat somebody or, or you know, cut somebody open, <laughs> which is yeah. just so obvious now. But back in the day, yeah. he was putting a mental institute for suggesting that. Mm -hmm. Like, people just thought he was absolutely crazy. Um, yeah. But there's two and, things and, there, isn't there? There's, there? there's what's for the best or what's good or what's useful for people. And then there's what keeps people in power. And often those things come into conflict. It's yeah, a fact. Yeah. Sad, but point. true. Anyway, mate, we better move on with the levels because I think we're trying to do this in one episode. We do the whole one on Chelicity. Well, this is what I suspected it would become, but uh, Chil you so, can't talk about Chelicity enough, man. It's it's like it's. Uh, so what what we said thing. is the the purpose of becoming a shaman is to get to learn to take nature as your teacher, not a human being, is to get rid of human beings as your teachers. I don't mean literally. Um, but even my teacher, my my main teacher in life, I, I still call him my teacher, but he wasn't really. He was more like a guide, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we we didn't choose, the two of us didn't choose the same life path at all. Very different people, but he was much more of a guide for me than a teacher. He didn't teach me what to do, ever, I think. Um, what he did was try to bring stuff out of me. I think he was successful. I mean, this podcast is partly down to his Kato Sensei. We're talking about Kato Ichi. Mm -hmm. uh, this podcast is partly down to him and his influence in my life. The over 25-year period. The issue is really that you're trying not to allow human beings to intervene between you and nature. So the question is, where do you start? There's a million places you could start, right? There's a, the wonderful world of shamanism. i tell you one of the great pluses of shamanism. It has a lot of negatives. And I think we might have talked about a few of them sometimes. It can be very frustrating, infuriating, difficult, scary. Um, it can mess you up a bit if you're not careful, especially if you don't have bat leaving level one and moving on to level two and so on. Um, if you neglect the bat for the gukuk and the... Um, and the Toshal team, it, it can have a lot of bad things. One of the good things is you'll never be bored. <laughs> it's never going to happen. There is virtually... It's a constant journey, isn't it? I mean, there are virtually infinite shamanic techniques, yeah. Every one of which is a portfolio of further shamanic technique um, in which any part of which you can become a master, in inverted commas, in the definition of what we mean by a master here. So you're never going to run out of stuff, that's for sure, you know. And shamanism becomes like a theme in your life. 
you you learn some techniques maybe from your teachers as I did initially, but then you get the idea of it, you get the flavor for it, and then you 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 can come up with endless shamanic technique. I uh, just thinking about building a shamanic piano, uh, you know, something that's very very natural. Uh, you know, think of the kind of wonderful natural materials that you could use. I mean, a lot of those a lot of those uh, great instruments. I'm not saying they're badly made; they definitely are very well made. And craftsmanship point of view the Steinways and what have you. They're beautifully finished and refined, aren't they? They're amazingly yeah. well polished and the people, and you can see the care and love that the people who make them put into them. But in a way, they are absolving, those people and their skills are absolving the people who are playing them's responsibility to a certain extent, from a shamanic point of view, not from a, we're not talking about entertaining people with music here, we're talking about shamanism. Yeah. They're absolving them the responsibility they are standing on the shoulders of giants, basically, without having the capability of those giants themselves. I know they have all other capabilities, but I'd be willing to bet that a lot of those guys that actually make them are not too bad at playing them either. You know, just a thought. The, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the, absolutely. But my, the, the, the images that come to mind are like land art images, you know, with a, a piano that's not finished. That, that has the, you can still see the wood, if it's made of wood, you can still see the branches and you can still see the, you know, or the rocks or whatever it is you've made it out of. They're still naturalistic looking. They've been managed by human beings into a form, just like when you make any kind of land art, they've been managed by human beings into a form where the thing will actually play. Um, but they remain entirely naturalistic in their shape, in their nature. It's not finely finished. It's not beautifully polished or made. Mm. I have an idea of like a very, very rough looking piano. You know, like the difference between a, a high tech ultralight backpacking tent that's made by some high tech company <laughs> yeah. uh, versus a bivouac made out of, you know, sticks and a, and a few leaves, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The piano I have in mind looks more like the bivouac than it does the high tech tent, you know? Um, and so, so what are you, what are you ultimately trying to achieve? Actually, uh, you're trying to make a platform for, platform for being able to learn from nature. That's stage one. If you're not empty, if you can't accept what nature gives you, if you're not in a position to pick up on that, to take it in, then there's no point in going further. Mm. But where do you start? Now, to me and to a lot of people historically, the best place to start seems to have been your own body because it's part of nature. Uh, it's, it's entirely contiguous with the rest of the universe. So that, and it's very close to you and it's around all the time. So despite what you may be told on various shamanism seminars, the, it's always there. And in a way, you can think of your body as that piano, that natural mm. piano that you're going to play, quote unquote. But to, before you start playing it, you really want to understand what it is, what makes it tick, how does it work? And I don't mean understand on the baseline because we've already done that. It's called biology. I did study at university among several other subjects. The, that's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is the experience of a human body the experiential learning of how a human body is constructed, how it works, how it operates on an instant-to-instant -instant basis, but over a long period of time. How does your breathing interact with your blood flow? How does your heart work? How does your uh, nervous system work in, res in relation to your musculature? How do the things that do your body does automatically like digestion work and how do the things that it, some of which it does automatically and some of which it is partially under conscious control like breathing most of the time you don't think about breathing and it just goes at a certain rate though it does change over time don't think i'm saying it goes at a constant range right um but then <laughs> you can quite easily make your breathing do something wacky because it's totally mm -hmm. under conscious control when you want it to be and so the using chelicity as a way to gather, if you think of chalisti as a pot, to gather knowledge and the things that are going into this pot and knowledge about how your body functions, experiential knowledge about how your body functions and works in its natural state, that is level two. That's the amska. 
And there's so much to that that I'm not going to go into a detailed description, but you can imagine lots and lots of different shamanic techniques that help you develop the skill. And what is the skill? The skill here is to be able to observe in a lightweight way what your body is doing, how it's responding to different things without affecting what your body is doing and how it's responding to different things. So, for instance, in the the, the recent uh, shamanism seminar we did over in Austria, I was getting people to tap out their heart rate on the floor without taking their pulse. Yeah. Because when you're in a state of chelicity, you can pick up on these sort of things. Uh, but if you're not in a state of chelicity, you probably won't be able to pick up on it, especially if you're quiet and relaxed. You might not be able to pick up on that without actually taking your own pulse. But you can do it. The only thing stopping you is the thing you've got to remove to develop the skill of AMSCA, which is the fact that we think we need a machine, like a, a heart rate monitor or something, or we need somebody to push, or we need to push my fingers into my into my wrist on the side of my neck in order to find out what my pulse is. No, I don't. I know what my pulse is. So it's it's this kind of thing. But then there's what does your pulse do? It has a slight double beat to it, um, which makes things much more interesting. What does it do in relation to the breath? What does it do in relation to the energy that's moving through the body? And what I'm the intention of the the brain is trying all this kind of stuff. AMSCA level two is the foundation for this. It's being able to genuinely observe yourself throughout, still with Bugashit Hurt Harate. So we're not just talking about I'm thinking about my hand or I'm thinking about my foot. Entire body, top to bottom, at all times. Developing that skill, that lightweight observation of self, and and what the energy changes are that go on within the body in different naturalistic situations and different day to day situations. For instance, when you switch flick a light switch and at what level of subtlety and at what level of understanding what changes happen within your body when you flick a light switch without thinking about it most people are unable to do that because it's been trained out of them since childhood but i guarantee you most wild animals have that they don't think about it on the baseline and they're not required to post rationalize it to somebody else afterwards but the bottom line is they do know what's going on and so yeah. that's the, the purpose of level two is to start to headbutt nature. What's the first bit of nature that you headbutt? That's your body, because it's the closest bit to you. Yeah. So that's that's kind of level two of shamanic technique and just developing that skill. And there's a billion that we've talked about them before, and we, we're not going to get this episode finished if we start talking about more examples. So we'll crack on. But just to say that's what it's about. Putting I'll some... just say one thing. Yeah, I'll just ask you one, th- one thing. Quick response, I promise. Um, you mentioned about animals just then. Would it be correct to say that animals in general, um, I know we're animals, of course, but you know, animals in general uh, are, are more in a state of chelicity on a constant basis because Wild of the animals. environment that they live in? Wild animals. Yeah. Uh, definitely not true of domestic animals. Absolutely not true in general. Yeah. Uh, but wild animals for sure. Uh, yeah, they have to be or they die. Yeah. So the and that's what it is. That's what I mean. What we talked about, we said talk about these things in terms of what you've got to get rid of. You've got to get rid of the ridiculous idea that you're not an animal, which is absolutely yeah. ludicrous if you think about the science science behind that. Apart from, from anything else, let's just have a baseline science discussion about whether you're an animal or not. How different, in percentage terms, are you from a gorilla or an orangutan? It, it's minute. It's tiny. The mm. difference is absolutely tiny. And a gorilla and an orangutan are animals, so human beings are animals. It's a no-brainer. But for some reason, we've treated ourselves differently. And, you know, if you want to... Uh, a good place to, to hear a little bit about that is the episodes we did on heretics about Genesis and how Genesis mm. sees human beings and animals as sort of somehow separate from each other. It's one of these learnings that's just completely nonsensical and false that we seem to have picked up from our crazy religious and other types of culture, political religious power culture. Uh, it is... Not true. We are animals. And what we're trying to do, which but so what are we trying to get rid of at level two in terms of our body? We're trying to get rid of the stuff that stops us being what we are. That's it. So level three. Okay, so that's 
Usually, level one, level two, we're talking about the body at rest, or the body doing very minor things. I think there's a lot of crossover between these two things. But we want to go further than that. We want to start understanding the body in activity, in context. And so what good ways to start understanding the body as the closest part of nature to us in more of a context? Because, you know, the body's sitting around doing nothing. And it's all very interesting and everything, but it's not very re reminiscent of the reality of human life or of, of life in general. Living things tend to do things. So level three, hey, let's start taking this understanding that we've built of the body and how its energy how energy works within the body and start doing things and see what effects that has. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about baseline analysis. I, you know, I can't say this yeah. too many times. Yeah. I'm talking about experiential learning of what the things that the body might be doing, what impact that might have on the things that we've learned that the body naturally does, if you like, in a state of rest at level two. And herein lies the great diversity of shamanic te technique, because virtually anything that you can do <laughs> can become a shamanic technique. But generally, you want to pick something that's quite rich, and you want to pe pick something that's quite close to you, and you want to pick something that's quite convenient, something that you can preferably do with stuff that you've got. Um, and we've given, I guess, the two most famous examples here that we've talked about. One is the dance spirit dance you know, the body starts moving uh, how does yes. that movement interact with the all the stuff that goes on in terms of the energetic um the i'm trying to think of the word the energetic patterns the energetic holicity holicity holistic of the of ness of the body of the human body mm. how does the how does that affect things that you've already learned at level two so for instance this this means it's completely pointless to go at level three unless you have some level of ability in level two and if you haven't developed some level of ability in level one you've got nowhere to put the stuff that you're getting out of level two so default this is what i mean by the extend into each other each one is a more sophisticated a more extended not sophisticated more extended version of the previous level if you like yeah, it's sort of like each stage morphs into the next in a continuum like we talked about. Exactly. So, 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 so you could say stage one becomes stage two, stage two becomes stage three. Oh, I'd prefer to say stage one is in stage two. Yeah. Uh, stage two, one and two are in stage three and they are foundations of those things. Uh, think of building a house. If you build the foundations, that's stage one. Uh, maybe yeah. you build the walls. That's stage two. Maybe you put in the the, the ground floor uh, rooms. That's stage three. Then you put in the upper floor. That's stage five, four. And then, you know, you put in the bathrooms or something. You know, it's that kind of thing. You're not going to be putting the bathroom into a house that you haven't built. Right. That's a, that would be a bit mad. Right. So so it's it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and obviously the other thing we've talked about at stage three is drum technique. Um but it can be anything, absolutely anything, including piano. Joe, I look forward to your naturalistic piano experiments. If you, you could start a second channel on your piano building, <laughs> shamanistic piano building. I need that like a hole in the head, Dermot. Yeah, I know you do, mate. I know. I just, <laughs> I just thought about it. Yeah. Um, I would love to do it. I'd love to do it. But, you know, I need it like I need a hole in the head as well. I'll, I'll, so, I'll, I'll weave it in. I'll weave it in. <laughs> <laughs> it's going all right. It's going all right. I think it would be popular. Approach. I think it could be popular. Anyway, yeah. um, so so, but the point is that you know, drum is not level three. You know, it's not a technique. Drum is a million techniques at level three, and spirit dance is a million techniques at level three. And of course, you can do spirit dance with a drum, and there's all sorts of crossover. But the bottom line is, at level three, we're just trying to find out what the Amps, if Amps gets level two, we're trying to find out what Sam or Butchig or, you know, whatever, uh, Booking Hengreg or any of these sort of level three uh, portfolios of technique, bags of lots of techniques have on Amska, and that's infinite. So even by the time you're, level, you're at level three, your potential for your shamanistic practice has become infinite. Uh, you're not even on to four, five, six, or seven yet, but that's 
That's the, We're the already point. at infinity. You're Jesus. already at infinity, mate. We won't hit level three. We, well, in some sense, we achieved enlightenment at level one, didn't we? Uh, what's what's the yeah. main thing that stops people achieving enlightenment? It's we're not worthy. That's the truth. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that on this yoga episode or maybe the next one that's coming up uh, on the Heretics podcast. So, so any any more on level three, mate, or can I crack on? Because this is thing, I don't want this thing to run over an hour. So. Well, we're already in over an hour, so crack on. Oh, That's sugar. absolutely fine. <laughs> we can, we can, um, oh, oh, goodness we me. can, we can wrap it up with it's a few an final observation. thoughts. That's an it's observation. I mean, we have to leave episode fifty-three for our new season, don't we? So I'm going to have to just do a wrap up. Uh, so I tell you what, no, let's not. Let's let's call this the end of part one, and we're going to do four, five, and six in part two. But it won't be the next episode. The next episode, we've got to level three here, so the next episode is we're starting on level four, yeah? And that will Absolutely. be level, level yeah. 50. Yeah. So let's yeah. let's draw a line under it there and say this is episode 49. Well, um, to be honest, uh, we're going to talk about level four as an introduction to level f- stage four anyway. So that's fine. Exactly. Um, and then exactly. We, can, we can sort of revisit four, five, and six in a more overarching sense in a later episode. That's fine. Uh, and like I said at the beginning of this episode, I'm going to label the episode so it'll be dead easy to find. And the... Um, the specific series yeah. of, of episodes that relate to stage four or any other any other aspect of series, I'll, I'll name them so that they're very easy to find and listen to in order, even if other episodes slot in between them. So that should be nice and easy to find now. Awesome, um, mate. So should we leave it there then? Yes, let's do that. Um, thanks again to everybody for listening. And uh, thanks to Joe for coming and anchoring. I really enjoyed it, mate. Uh, I am yeah, enjoying. Yeah. We need to get back into this. These are almost like yeah. it's almost like therapy for me doing these. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's me great. too. Me like, too. We're, come back we're to on again tomorrow. And it's, we, we, we're lighting up. So yeah, we'll um, yeah. we'll crack on tomorrow, and we're going to start stage four of shamanism. So thanks ever so, uh, ever so much for listening, guys. Um, it means a great deal. We are absolutely going to get this podcast back up and running. Uh, it's been been a long time coming, but uh, we'll um, we'll just put we're that into action. It. So so there we go. We're doing it. Um, yep. Thanks a lot for uh, for listening. I was going to say watching. I've got to ke- be careful now about what I say because I'm <laughs> yeah, so used I mean, to saying my YouTube, YouTube videos. Like, say at watching, the beginning yeah. of this episode, I was like, "Creatives, welcome to the wo- uh, no, sorry, <laughs> I'll get back into it, Damon." But um, yeah, thanks a lot, guys, and we will see you in the next episode.